and welcome to another edition of Urban Talks from the Center of Architecture and Metropolitan Planning in Prague. Uh, today with a very special guest who, of course, can't be here in, in person due to the lockdown, but uh, she's joining us from the middle of the forest in North Carolina. Uh, I, uh, Jean Gang needs no introduction, but I'm going to try to do so anyway. Uh, she's an American architect based in, uh, in Chicago, um, sort of the founding principal of Studio Gang, who is famous for uh, a number of projects in Chicago and worldwide. Uh, among them, uh, the Aqua Tower in Chicago, the Vista Tower currently finishing Chicago, the Writers Theater in Glencoe, or perhaps you might know uh, the expansion of the American Museum uh, of Natural History. Uh, Jean is a professor at the Harvard Graduate School, Graduate School of Design. She, is, uh, she wrote three books about architecture and a new monograph of Studio Gang is coming out this spring. Uh, finally, last but not least, uh, last year Time Magazine has included Jean Gang among uh, 100 most influential people in the world as the only architect. So Jean, welcome to camp, at least virtually. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Even I wanted to be there in person, but this will be. Uh, hopefully, we'll, get, we'll uh, have you here in person soon. Uh, we see that you're in the middle of uh, North Carolina, is it? <laughs> yes, in the middle of the forest, getting some fresh air. Great. And um, uh, trying well, to think of how to bring this amount of biodiversity back to the city um, when I go back. That sounds good. Uh, we're probably going to have a lot of questions from the audience, but for now on, I would like to at least hypothetically sort of pass the floor to you for your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. And I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about the work that we do in our process at Studio Gang um, and, and what really drives us at the office. Um, this is a shot inside our, one of our shops. Um, we, we bought this building, which is an old bank, 1934 bank, um, to have our headquarters on it. And um, as we were trying to repair this building and care for it, we decided to do a little experiment on the roof, which is add a space for um, getting together and talking about issues, but also do a big experiment about the green roof. Um, we've all heard of green roofs and buildings, but this one's a little bit different. Um, we tried to increase this biodiversity on our roof, um, and we've been measuring it over time. Um, this image here, you can see people out on the deck, but we also used this glass that is um, visible to birds, so we don't have bird strikes on this totally transparent pavilion on the roof. Um, we use it for yoga, other things for, you know, within our office, and we try to create, you know, to maintain a really strong community within the collaborators and the architects and designers that we work with. We have some hives up there for honey, bees, um, and this is a shot looking at this biodiversity experiment. So every year, right in around August, we do a 24-hour capture of all the life that is going on on this rooftop. So we have about 48 different um, varieties of, of regionally appropriate plants. And, and then we capture the insects and log them. Um, we, we look at the, all the living things, including what's inside the soil. So we, have, we do this together with ecologists. Um, sometimes we invite students over um, and, and it, it becomes a way to create these relationships with people who are interested in their environment like us and a relationship between us and our environment. Um, we made a little book about this island, we call it the island in the sky. Um, and the goal is really that now that we see it's working, um, we're going to, help our neighbors to um, create green roofs on their buildings and over time create almost like a, a, an urban um, sky island corridor through Chicago. And, and so we've already begun with our neighbors uh, to the east who are at Montessori school and with others. So um, places bring us together. Um, our office now is in Chicago, San Francisco, New York and, and Paris. Um, um, and we do a lot of different projects, not only buildings, but also things like this book. And I, I wanted to show, walk you through the way that we think about architecture. Um, this is about, this is a book about the Chicago River and 
Um, it's called reverse effect because the Chicago River was actually reversed in its direction about a hundred years ago. And the aim of this book was to gather up the latest research, but also to um, share this information with the public in in um, in advance of some important legislation that was being voted on about um, improving the water quality. So if you look back in time, uh, the river was always treated, you know, as an industrial waterfront in our city in Chicago, and it was very polluted. And over time, um, you get this, you have this incredible problems um, kind of mounting up, a bad water quality in the upper left, flooded basements. On the lower right, you have these threat of invasive species coming up the river and also the potential, I guess, of the of the Chicago urban riverfront and how to convert that into something that would work for city residents today. And in doing this book, the main thing we discovered was really that the city should get control of this or, uh, post-industrial waterfront and to help increase public access to it. And in doing that, people will start to care about this river more. Um, along the way, um, the, this book got into the hands of our mayor in Chicago, and the mayor decided to do a number of projects to give people access to the river. And so one of them, we, we're doing two little boathouses, and other architects are doing riverfront projects now to try to bring people to this river and give them access to it so that they can care about it. This boathouse um, um, is now really a gateway to the riverfront. And it was inspired by the design part of it. You know, it has to be good architecture. The, the design part of it was really about trying to capture motion and that activity and announce the excitement of this new access point to the river. Here's a picture of the early model of it. Um, and it really stemmed from studying rowing. Um, and we took these different positions of the oars and just translated it into a roof form. <laughs> and, and I mean, like little Vs and Ms. And then in doing that, we we're able to bring in natural light um, to warm the building, which is really not uh, heated in the winter. and. Um, make it really an exciting space. Um, it's clad with slate. You can see here, you can see the team of girls uh, from Chicago going out to use this riverfront. Um, there's spaces in it that can be used for after school studying um, and training in, in the colder months. And now they've even expanded the programs to have um, classes for, these are uh, veterans that um, are learning to row for the first time in the winter, and yoga, again, yoga classes, that things that you can't explain. So this is really a community building, building, but it's also access to this riverfront, um, and, and it announces its publicness to, to everyone when you see it because of this roof form and the, the space between the buildings that bring you to the river. Um, so that shows a way of relating to nature, but also being conscious of community. And it, it's hard to do that, let's say, if you have a spec office building in New York City, for example. So I want to show how we've thought about the community in a building like that. Um, this image that you see here is from Hugh Ferris, who, who was a delineator of um, of zoning in the city of New York. And, and these were done in the 20s to show the way the step back skyscraper should work in order to bring light down, light and air to the streets. Um, and this is our building. It's located along the High Line. This is a rendering of 4010th Ave. And we did something similar, but we had a different situation. So I want to show you that. Maybe some of you might have seen the High Line, which is in the foreground of this image. Um, and our site was located along the High Line on one side and along a street and then the Hudson River beyond. Um, 
when, when we applied the step back zoning to our site, like in the upper left, an L-shaped site, the resulting building is what you can see in the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> uh, sorry, the lower left-hand corner, the, the applied zoning would basically shadow out the high line and in fact, kind of like kill all the plants. Um, and so instead in the upper right-hand corner now, um, with the red volume, we, we asked the city if we could um, have a variation to that zoning and take away volume along the high line and place it on top of the building and then carve the building away to bring light in. Um, the reason why that zoning didn't work on this site is because the high line is a, is an, a linear park in the middle of the block, in the center of the block, not on the edges. So I think you have to be able to respond to the specifics of the site um, for the greater good. And so th this is a diagram of how we shaved and carved the building to bring light down to the high line, the, the public park in the middle of the block. Um, in doing this approach, we were able to show that we could increase the daylight hours immensely uh, to that space in the High Line. Um, and this is just showing the development of the carved areas where they become more articulated and really um, special, special areas that for, uh, like I said, that we don't know who would occupy this building, but special areas that, sh that you can occupy um, for offices, for collaboration, um, that take advantage of these views of the High Line. So um, this is just a view during the construction where you can see the carved area on the left and the views out to the Hudson River on the right. Um, some more construction shots um, with this faceted glass that really um, announces the area. So we were able to do this with a kind of a unitized system that's repetitive um, so that we could afford it. And you can see it going up here. And this view, you can see the high line on the right. Um, and looking up on it, it really has this dynamic quality. And some of these panes of glass reflect downward. So you can see the activity on the street. Um, this is a view looking through that. And as well, the color of the glass and this type of glazing helps to reduce the impact to um, uh, migratory birds that travel along the Hudson River. So you can kind of see that we are um, thinking about people using the building, but also where, how it impacts the environment and how um, it impacts other species besides our own um, and how it interacts with the light and, and the public spaces around it. So that was, like I said, it, it was a little bit difficult because we didn't know who was going to use this, but we knew we wanted to do something that would improve the neighborhood. Um, a lot of times, you know, in, in the States, we have a lot of tall buildings and you're asked to um, design a tall building. And, and when we first got our first commission to do that, um, I really wanted to understand what the benefit of a tall building would be. Um, and this is a study that um, reveals that in, in a compared to a spread out suburban environment, um, which you also have in the States, uh, a, a more compact city with vertical, um, a vertical orientation saves a lot of carbon from going into the atmosphere. So in a typical household, um, a typical family, um, you would, you would have, spent 1.9 tons of carbon per year in a taller building in this compact city and 14 tons per year in a suburban layout. Um, so a lot of the, in our first tower was really about uh, trying to bring people to the city um, and, and to reduce their carbon footprint. One of the downsides of tall buildings though is that you spend a lot of time in the elevator and it, it's, it's not exactly social. Um, so with the Aqua Tower, we really tried to uh, create spaces where people could have social relationships um, on the exterior of the building. And to do that, we designed almost a landscape, a vertical landscape of topography 
uh, that you could inhabit. And this is probably a little choppy for you. I forgot that it was a video, but um, you can start to see these um, balconies all the way up to 82, you know, 82 floors on the building. And they can be, you know, small, medium, and large, used for everything from just sitting outside to big parties. Um, and and what's happened is, you know, I think we learned in the, the this COVID nineteen crisis how important it is to be outside and to also to be able to see your neighbors. I mean, the way that um, music was being played on balconies, um, the way that people had conversations across balconies. I think this is a really important thing for tall buildings and for medium buildings to be able to step outside and get some fresh air. Um, this is another building that we did. I just wanted to show the balconies, a smaller building where um, each of the balconies is thought of as a stem that goes down. And so all of the gravity loads come down to the ground and, and people have these amazing, um, like a threshold to your house or a porch um, on the balcony. Um, here's a view that shows um, a model of the, the balcony stem, I call it, um, on the right. And on the left, you can see how they interact and the, the pattern that, that transforms over the height of these balconies. Oops, um, hold on, I'll go there. Um, so in plan, um, you can see the south side has the balconies and the north side has bay windows looking to the city. Um, and it creates a real pattern, almost um, a, a very activated uh, way to connect with your neighbors. So what the building is doing is creating these potential relationships between each other, but also to the outside. Um, and here you can see where I was saying it's almost Escher-esque. Um, another taller building that we did called Solstice uses the facade to create balconies. Only here we only we were only supposed to give balconies to um, a third of the units. Uh, sorry, two thirds of the units. Um, and these we we used a tilted glass that is on the angle of the solstice in order to create uh, this dynamic pattern and to create a um, reflection of, of the surrounding landscape on this tilted down glass. Um, and what it does is it reduces the heat gain um, of the building. So for example, when you have summertime, um, the sun is high in the sky and none of that heat goes into the building. And when you have winter time, when the sun is low in the sky, it can enter the building and warm the space. So this angle, which is the solstice that we, at that exact um, latitude, is what we use to, to, to create this uh, building and its facade. Um, and then inside, this is a picture just of some, there's common areas, there's areas for socializing. Um, and you can see that what the tilted glass um, does in a space like that uh, really connects you to this outside area. Um, and one more uh, project that we're, we're using a, a balcony in a much taller building is this project called Mira, um, located in San Francisco. And here we're, we, we're looking at bay windows in San Francisco, kind of a vernacular um, architecture there. And we took the bay windows and, and rotated them so that the building has this vibrancy and liveliness to it. Um, and this is still in construction, so it's not finished yet, um, but it really does have a lot of movement. Um, and each of these bays, we, we were able to um, insulate them and, and finish them before and, and apply them um, with all the waterproofing and everything already finished. Um, so it was really a, a fast way of, of constructing as well. And also very um, robust and thermally insulated. Um, so it will achieve a very high level of performance uh, that you can see in this, this image. So this is a, you know 
almost finished um, how this building is starting to really connect to its surroundings um, and also give people that occupy the building different views, but give something back to the public. People that are walking down the street can enjoy the variety that they see. Okay, so I, I wanna switch scales um, to talk about some of our work that is for, um, well, smaller scale, but also really um, embodying this idea of relationships. How can architecture create better relationships? Um, first project is Kalamazoo College, the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership. And, and it's, it's really, um, it's on a small campus and they really wanted a building that would, would help students um, study social justice and, and become future leaders. Um, and, and so in this building, because the campus was a very traditional campus, um, we didn't really want to make a, a replication of, of some of those architectures because it was such a new program. Um, you can see the site here is a small college, a four-year college in Michigan. Um, and the pink dot is where the site was located. So on the site, you had this grove to the south, a view of the campus on one side, and then a connection to the neighborhood on the north uh, west side of the building, three different kind of contexts, if you will. And the typical architecture here was what we would call um, like neo-colonial, which is not exactly a style or anything colonial that we wanna have in a center for social justice leadership. So um, we want, but we still wanted to pick up on the, the, the materiality and the college really wanted it to fit in. So we started with just thinking about, you know, what is social justice? And normally social justice, it could be a demonstration about human rights, LGBT issues. It, 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 it happens in the street. It could be a painting on a wall. Um, and, and so, but this building is really not about the part that is happening on the street. It's about planning, um, planning these acts of social justice uh, leadership, demonstrating, planning, planning out how to do it. So the references uh, we looked at, because there is no, there's no existing kind of typology that would be a center for social justice. So we looked at these community meeting houses and they're really interesting. They're vernacular buildings. Uh, this one is in Mali. This one is in Indonesia, and they always have people facing each other. So that's very important. Sometimes around a fireplace, sometimes around water, um, sometimes with the connection to the sky. And the one in Mali has got this low ceiling, so people stay seated and calm. Nobody stands up and, and gets angry in this elder house. Um, and we, we, know that the, the Arcus Center what really wanted, the faculty wanted people to feel relaxed and have this. So we, we created a space like that within the Arcus Center around a fireplace, um, really like promoting very direct conversations and other places within the building that, that could be used for just a few people or for very many people um, as well. And you can see these little study nooks that are for um, students and faculty, uh, students and faculty uh, planning social justice seminar rooms, and then a, a kind of a performance space, lecture space that opens up to this beautiful grove. And so the, the three different contexts um, that I told you about connect to these big windows. Um, and it became, um, important to define the exterior of the building and and we decided to use wood wood for some of the structure wood for the exterior to reduce the carbon footprint but also because this is a um, these woodlands are grown sustainably and you can harvest it nearby um, and so we also kind of stumbled upon again it's like a vernacular building in the in the michigan area 
and it was uh, over a hundred years old and it was made with wood masonry. Um, so our task was at Studio Gang was to figure out how can we build a wood masonry building in the 21st century and make it, um, bring it into the 21st century, but, but take advantage of the fact that it's really, it's storing carbon, sequestering carbon, um, and not putting it into the atmosphere. Uh, this is a video, so you probably can't really see it too clearly, but you know, it just talks about how trees absorb the carbon. So when it's put into, you know, when it's not over-processed, you can really store that carbon in the building, in the building material. And we really um, spent time figuring out how to make this aesthetically beautiful. Um, with really the, the mortar, um, really trying to get the joints tight. And it, it came out really beautiful, really well. And so it's a building that really brings people closer together to work on these important projects and also connects like in this kind of community, like a barn uh, building exercise with your neighbors, um, connects to community in a nice way. Each of the sides um, weathers a little bit differently and it's, it's looking very beautiful. And here you can see it from above with the different um, windows pointing out to the different contacts around it. Um, another building kind of in the similar vein in a smaller scale environment in a community uh, north of the city of Chicago is the site for the Writers Theater and here uh, we have the site, here's Lake Michigan in the background. And there was a small community with a very kind of car oriented and they, they wanted this theater uh, to be a place where it could almost have a civic role, a place for community. Um, we looked a lot at theaters before there were buildings uh, like in the street theaters or open air theaters like the, the Globe, uh, that was in uh, 17th century London um, as an urban um, experience. And, and with Shakespeare's theater, this one was, um, this is called an inn yard the, um, where they would have the performances in the courtyard and people could look out from all around. So we thought maybe there could be a space kind of like this within the theater that could be um, not the performance space, not the formal performance space, but like a space that could be more of a civic space. And so we, we uh, decided to use that lobby, which you can see in this axon as this third uh, space for performance and civic activity. Um, around the lobby is a walkway, which gives you the views into the lobby. And we've done this with timber but very thin uh, battens of timber that, that carry the walkway in tension around that space. So they're, it's hanging from this, this truss work and these thin battens. Um, to do that, of course, it wasn't allowed to do a structure like that and we had to test it. This is our testing machine and the engineers and the team up on top. So basically we pulled it apart until it, it failed, which it didn't. Um, and we were able to get approval to do this building. Each of the, the connections is um, highly crafted, this wood connection with no steel, it's, it's solid wood, um, a solid wood connection. Um, so we call this the cat's paw in the building because it looks a little bit like in the picture on the right, like a, a cat's paw. Um, and in this image, you can see the cat's paws at the bottom of the um, beam holding this walkway around the space. Um, so in intermission, uh, you can walk out and take a stroll around the space and it's almost like you're up in the canopy of the, the park that's nearby. And inside, it really is this flexible space where people can gather before the show, after the show, have dialogue and it's, it's become a really beloved space over the last few years that uh, are now being used as a cafe um, and study space for students. This is one of the rooftop 
images um, of the building. Oops. And then um, you can see these giant doors that we have that open it up to the park. So it really connects to the landscape around it. Um, this is a view of it at night where that structure, which is made of these Virendil wood timber trusses and, um, and mass timber decking and hangs it as a walkway in the canopy um, and kind of announces the space, welcoming everyone in for this kind of public dialogue. Um, moving up in scale, but still connecting to the natural environment and, and the space around it. I wanted to show you this uh, project called the, the American Museum of Natural History. It's a, it's a wing adding onto existing, very well-known um, history. This is a picture of Central Park um, in New York, and you can see the Hudson River in the background. Um, in this project, the museum really wanted us to think about moving beyond this idea of specimens under glass, which, you know, with the dioramas in the museum um, and the collections um, was the, the way that natural history was thought about in the past. Um, but in reality, there's a lot of field work going on. These are um, scientists who are studying fossils and um, collecting fossils. They do a lot of this work outside the museum. And they also are using new tools inside the museum. This is MRI photography. Uh, so using tools from medical science to scan and understand anew um, the, the materials in these collections. So there's a lot of active science going on in, in this space. One of the problems in, in the US right now is that science education is, is really dropping. And I think uh, the museum points out that the U.S. is like 26th or something like that <laughs> in the ranking of science education. And, and so they really want to bring new people to uh, science, students, parents, everyone, teachers, even postdocs, um, and provide uh, opportunities for education and learning for lifelong learning. Um, we started with what's there. This is a, a plan of the American Museum of Natural History. And um, it was the original master plan. And you can see that the building was supposed to be a square with four courtyards. Um, and it would have these axes, north, south, east, west axes, um, and a central building. But the only part that was originally built was this part at the bottom. Um, and what happened over time is they started adding into this campus. I think there's something like 26 buildings now, um, adding them in and filling in the courtyards. Um, and this is the yellow dot is where um, the new wing is supposed to go. Um, and this is the construction of the main entrance um, in the 1930s um, on Central Park West. Um, and here's another view of turning around and looking at the building from uh, the Columbus Street side where we're um, doing this new wing. Um, and so you can see that there's a lot of different uh, kinds of architecture here. Um, but our task was to provide a new entry. So these are the three main entries here. This is our site where there wasn't, there was not much of an entry at all. Um, and get people to start coming in this new entry that would be totally accessible um, and, and introduce the opportunities in education at this point. The interesting thing about Manhattan, and as you can see, we always start with kind of looking beyond the immediate site, but there's this, um, it's not exactly north, south, east, west. Um, it's, it's at a slight angle. And this axis on 75th Street goes right through the park, in fact, and through the museum. Um, it, but one of the problems with the museum is that, that people always get lost in there and because there were a lot of dead ends and, not, and it's not very well connected. Um, but on this axis, on this interesting Manhattan axis, there's an event called Manhattan Eng, 
which was the term was coined by uh, one of the scientists in the um, Rose Center for Earth and Space from the museum. And he noticed that uh, on certain days of the year, two times um, during the year, you would get this total axial sunset um, in Manhattan. And people started to really, you know, take notice of this and gather around and take pictures. But our idea was, what if we could create that inside the museum, a kind of relationship to this outer, um, this outer set of relationships and orbits, in fact, to the greater um, environment. And so the idea of, is combining, this is a sketch, you know, early sketch, just showing a collage, showing this idea of like a landscape of discovery um, aligned with this Manhattan axis. And so we started asking ourselves, would it be possible to make a museum that feels more like you can explore it and find all this excitement in, the, in something like a canyon? Uh, so this is an early sketch just showing a theater, this kind of central atrium, and these edges that you can explore, um, and thinking of it like a space, an iconic space, instead of the exterior of the building. Um, this is a more developed drawing showing these relationships between the um, building museum around it and the axis. Um, and so what we did was edit out some of the space around the central theater that existed and create over 30 different new connections uh, so that visitors can like make a full complete loop and really have better understanding of the content of the museum and, and provide this entry that, was, that would be really dynamic and almost like an exploration. And so to do, to understand canyons, we actually took our team, our whole team to um, explore some canyons out west in the U United States, different gorges and so on. Um, and and we, we use these as inspiration and to understand what it means to have surfaces that are eroded by water, wind, and, and air. Uh, water, wind, and, and um, erosion. So, and like, for example, this, this void right here is created by um, erosion of wind uh, to make a portal like that. Um, and so through drawing and, and studying these uh, precedents in the landscape, um, we started to try to create that in an architectural form. You know, there are architectures that have tried to capture discovery and inspiration in their architecture. These are a couple examples. Um, and and we, we had a very specific site. We want to do it in a way that encourages people to explore the museum. Um, one of the me methods we used was using these blocks of ice and melting out the ice. So very analog uh, methods um, in, in, to study erosion and surfaces. These are all images of our blocks of ice. Um, and then, and we you know pour hot water into this uh, to create voids. Um, then we digitized these forms and, and kind of rationalized them so they could be built. Um, and these are more 3D printed models of that. A lot of times we were building very rough models as well to, to get these kind of spaces. Um, this kind of, it, it is not blob architecture because, you know, I don't know if you know that term, but, you know, we couldn't do these specific types of forms with existing software. So we actually wrote programs with a software developer that would help translate our form um, with these porous form into a model that could speak directly to our BIM model. Um, and so what it is is a kind of a structure, a cavern structure that holds up the floors of the new wing. So it's structural, um, it's, it's spatial, um, and the only thing left is figuring out what way we want to build this. Uh, so we had been studying these opportunities, I'll show you. So here, here's an image of what that uh, central atrium looks like that connects to all the different parts of the museum. Um, and, and we looked at infrastructure. So basically looking at these kind of um, underground, these are uh, on the left, um, tunnels in Manhattan where they use this technique called shotcrete where you don't have to actually build the formwork. You can you could shoot the concrete into the rebar, into the uh, reinforcing. 
um, and, and this is one of the finished mock-ups of what the portal will be like with some tests of different concrete. Um, and behind this portals, there will be lots of things to discover like this uh, very big, large um, display of their collections in the museum. Um, and then as a facade, this is the old facade facing Central Park West, the Theodore Roosevelt Memorial. Uh, we will also use stone but in this different way that's more connected to the way that it, uh, the patterns it has in nature, uh, using uh, these striated bands um, on the facade to en enclose and connect to the surrounding areas. So inside it's just gonna have these amazing spaces that are all, like I said, structural uh, spaces that, want, that encourage people to explore. There's a theater, uh, there's a, a live insect museum, and here you can see the relationship to this uh, collections core. And there'll be spaces like a library where you bring the collection, they actually have these um, authentic library collection of historic books, but bring that together with data collection, citizen science, um, actual um, specimens, and create a new way of learning. Uh, this is that greater library space that you would see. Uh, there will be a place for live butterflies that people can, uh, kids can see, and then a rooftop that ultimately connects you to this um, axis along 75th Street and Manhattan Henge. So it's creating this exciting space for learning about science and nature, but also connecting to actual nature at the American Museum of Natural History. And finally, I just want to show very quickly um, a project that's very small, but it does this work of connecting people to each other and the environment. Um, it's a, we were asked to design a pavilion in a park, uh, in a zoo actually. Um, but um, to start this project, we thought, you know, it's not just a pavilion, it's really a place. How can we make an exciting place? So it's a 40 acre site. On a, um, in Chicago, um, right in the middle of the city, uh, with a zoo around it. And, and what we wanted to do was really to um, take this place and make it into a vibrant um, ecology. Um, it was previously a kind of rundown a pond, more of a picturesque version of nature. And what we've done is to um, create a biodiverse area where um, this Urban Wildlife Institute is able to study nature in cities and kids are able to learn about cities. This is like a, a monitor that uh, records um, bats in the area. Um, there are now something like 183 species of birds that have been attracted to this area. And it, some of these birds, um, it's very interesting because they, um, they started, they, it was like build it and they will come. I mean, this is like a zoo with no cages where animals just come to use it and to display themselves on, of their own accord. And now we have um, lots of kind of mammals. These are night cams that picked up different mammals in the city. And, and so I'm really interested in how these two, how, how can we have urban environments and wild, more biodiverse nature in the same plane because we need each other. So the pond is actually doing the work of uh, capturing rainwater and it's a storm water um, res reservoir. So it helps people from you know, flooding basements nearby. And so then we designed the pavilion to be very flexible. It was originally designed for um, education and classes but it started to be used for many different things. And I think this is, um, it really, I've been watching this um, over the years since it's been complete. And it's really doing what we want, which is um, making a place, using architecture to build stronger relationships between people, like creating social space, but also connecting people to their wider environment and to um, the environment beyond. So we've seen it used for dance, um, yoga, again, I think all of our projects somehow inspire people to use it for yoga. Um, but also people start to 
get engaged here and it became it's like the number one spot for weddings in the city um so it does show that architecture can inspire relationships that people want to be in this space i mean these are just pictures i got off the internet you know like just searching it and finding people's um engagement photos and wedding photos you know and if a building can make you want to kiss someone i think you're getting in there going down the right path especially with our um the current polarization that we have in politics right now so we need more architecture that does this and just to end it's a beautiful event that happened at this um lincoln park zoo nature boardwalk where um the Diné and blanc where um people it's an impromptu dinner where you bring a picnic basket and dress up in in white with white tablecloths and they took up the entire uh, for this event. My goal is that um, architecture can help people get together, but it can also help make us uh, better partners with the rest of the natural world as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I want to kind of kick off with some common themes that we've heard uh, during your presentation. And one of them, uh, of course, uh, is, is sort of building relationships. And, 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 and you've, you've said that even in some artic uh, articles that you're a relationship builder as an, as an architect. And uh, I want to focus on the sort of the, the, in some of the high rises, such as the aqua tower, the, the balconies and everything, uh, they sort of, in theory, uh, uh, encourage for people to meet. And I want to know what it is and what it's like in practice. Do you have any stories? Do people hang out uh, across the balconies, even in the, in the high rises? Do, 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 you, do you have any uh, stories about that? Yeah, we, you know, we, we try to follow the buildings after they're done. And, and the, the, um, the Aqua Tower became, it, it was a nice building because it also had mixed um, income levels. So you could, there were, there's a hotel, so people staying there temporarily, um, apartments that you could buy and apartments you can rent and some very small and some apartments that are, um, um, the rent is um, supplemented, so it's for people that can't afford um, the market rate. And so it has a big mix of people. And, and we found that um, it, it has attracted a lot of um, younger people that want to meet other people. <laughs> and, and even meeting, like we've heard people have met and gotten together from meeting on the balconies. So I do think it's possible. I, so it does work I, in practice as well. <laughs> work in practice, yes. Good. I'll just put up my slides so we can <laughs> see which one you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess another big theme, of course, uh, of your whole practice is sort of ecological sustainability and, and, and all of that. That's another thing that I'd like to uh, sort of come back to. Uh, how do you think this current situation is going to help or not help that uh, sort of bringing back some some of that or encouraging more sustainability is that something that will happen? Are you talking about the current situation with COVID nineteen? Yes, yeah, so with the lockdown and us everything you know being stuck yeah. at home and uh, right. <laughs> I think I mean I think what it tells us is that we have it's so critical. I mean we we believe in the city. You know the city, like I said in the beginning, we need to live in this more compact arrangement and not spread all over the countryside, you know? And um, that reduces the energy that we use. And we're social beings. We need to be, have contact with those people. So I think what it tells us is that green space within cities, and in my view, biodiverse green spaces is, should be thought of more like infrastructure, like we have to have it and there has to be enough of it for everyone to be able to use, you know, in, this, in situations like this. And also for buildings to be able to connect people to the outdoors. And I think the balcony is the perfect element, example of, it's a place where you can feel the weather, you're more connected to the weather, you're more connected to your neighbors. Um, and and it, it will build our awareness of, of the environment and and also you know with 
outdoor spaces, we have more tolerance of temperature differentiation. And um, so, you know, we shouldn't be designing buildings that, that lock people up indoors and have, you know, forced mechanical systems. We really need to bring fresh air to all of our buildings. And I think that that's another big lesson from this uh, pandemic. And also, um, with a lot of your projects, uh, there's an emphasis on ecology, but there's also a lot of these projects are quite dense. They're, they're, they're kind of high density. And uh, is high density ecological? And, and in, in what ways can sort of dense cities be good or bad? Yeah, I think I think they're good. Um, I, of course, you know we there there's need like I said there's need for a certain amount of open and green space for everyone too. So we have to be clever about how we design them. And um, rivers are a great element that go through many cities that we can make public edges on the river to connect people to those. Like in the first project that I was showing in the um, with the reverse effect. Um, project where it was really about the Chicago River, and and um, you know this this is a city that in the past we did not have um, that that was not public space along the river that is um, industrial space uh, reserved for big you know for in the old days for like production uh, and then for shipping. Um, and, and so the, the point is to, to try to get that area back into the public space, into the public realm. And that's another great way to bring this open space through the middle of a dense city. I also kind of want to talk a little bit about your sort of working process. You have, you've shown us a lot of uh, kind of uh, big high-scale, high-rise projects, but you also have quite a bit of small-scale projects. You even did some exhibitions, right? There, I just saw one in, in Paris, the one about uh, ah. uh, Belia. Uh, Belia no, Exactly, that's the one. <laughs> so I, I, is that a conscious process? You say, you know, we do one big project and then we do a small one, or is that just, just kind of random? No, that, that's a great, uh, you know, a lot of people ask like, why, why we do such things like Belia which is an exhibit uh, that we designed to help people understand more about cetaceans and the ocean and how the cetaceans, uh, whales, basically live in social groups and, and, the, and some of the problems that they're encountering with you know, pollution, noise, um, and other human-caused um, problems. Um, and so it was educational, but, but I think as we realized as, you know, as architects, we all have the ability to help to communicate things visually and we can tell a story. And so exhibitions, um, on the one hand, we do that just because we're, I am an activist. I want things to happen. And i I know that a building takes, five, six years to build. Um, and an exhibition can be done very quickly. Um, and, and I get to pick what, what we want to be involved with. I mean, so, so I think everyone that's an architect has passions about things and they, and it, it, it's a very liberating feeling to be able to do projects that you just want to do that are, um, you know, for education or for your, for me, the environment, um, but also this aspect of with Balianopolis, like that whales are social too. I mean, we are learning more and more. So we worked with scientists and researchers uh, to bring the latest discoveries to the public. Um, and so, so we do, the other great thing about exhibitions is the material experiments that you can do as well. Um, and so we've worked with a lot of times it's a, for the purpose of working with the material like um, stone. We designed this marble curtain that's like hanging in tension. We did a giant um, space called Hive made out of um, cardboard tubes uh, for people to, uh, it was like an acoustic space in the national um, 
building museum in Washington. So those are kind of ongoing research projects, I guess. And we, we, um, we're committed to being, you know, demonstrating what we care about as architects. And, and I, I speak for all, you know, all my collaborators too, my teams, because we're pretty much all love doing that. And um, it's a great way to get action. I call it actionable idealism. <laughs> Just a way of, you know, doing things that will, will help move the ball forward for environment and is there a project that you, or type of building perhaps, that you've always wanted to do but haven't had the chance? Um, well, I'm really, I think more and more, um, I, I see that it's important for buildings, it's, it's important to have public access to buildings that if you want people to experience it and to be moved by it. And so I've, I've really, our cultural buildings, we've done some, museums and in process and and theaters and um, music venues I think those are really great ways to um, introduce people to architecture I I know um, yeah so I but I what I think is happening is I want to bring some of these typologies together so for example if we were um, doing a concert hall for example that I know you guys are thinking about in Prague, it, it, how would you make it more of a, um, bring some aspects of other programs to that. So, so it's not only that, but it can also be civic space um, and space where people can do different things. Um, so like the writer's theater uh, we were talking about, um, it, it was, it's a theater, it's, it's for performance, but it also has these, just these casual uses that could happen there. People can drop in and study. There's a cafe that started to show up. It, and what's really cool about that project is, um, and the reason why I like this kind of performance space, I think, is that people really want to talk to each other after and before. Um, and so you have a great opportunity to find out where, where those kind of things can happen. Um, and this space, just this is taken early on, but it, it's become so used by the public for different activities. Um, so I think, yeah, it's almost like bringing almost like a, a, a social space, a library to the <laughs> to the theater typology. So th those are really interesting dynamics that I want to continue to work on. Um, Great. I think we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. We have one from Lucas asking, what is the best scenario for architectural competition? I mean, for creativity, motivation on the architect, architect side and best possible results on the client side. Mm. Um, I think the, the, that's a great question because it, it's true that when you're creating a competition, you're, you're you know, you want to get as precise as you can, and when you're, but you, when you're evaluating it at, from the architect's point of view, you think of a few things. I mean, one is, um, you know, will it? Is it an important thing to spend our time on? Is it important to us? Is it, is it important to the city? Is it important to the people that will use it? Um, so that kind of, it, it's not a, a strict data point, but it, it, it's kind of a sense that you get. Um, and the second thing is really like, is there a high level of probability that it will happen? Because, um, we've seen in the past, you know, that sometimes there's, there's a desire to do a competition, but there's not the political, um, engine behind it. There's not the commitment. And so it might not happen. I, I had that experience with one of my first competitions that we won, um, it was an important project um, and it was important to, to me as a young architect and it really influenced my later work, the Ford Calumet Environmental Center. Um, but there wasn't like the political will behind it to get it done. So we tried for so long and we, you know, um, and it just, it just couldn't get over the line. So 
Um, so that's important. The political will, I think it's in, you know, and the funding, of course. Um, the third thing is really, is, is it fair? Uh, um, and if we look at the jury and the process and things like that, because it, it really, you know, that it's, that there's not already a predetermined architect that, that someone has in mind. <laughs> and then, like, so even having said all that, I think, you know, we always learn from doing a competition and we, as a team, get stronger on, on uh, an idea that we want to do. And, and it, it, it's not lost, but, but those are some of the things that we would think about. Uh, we have another question by by Peter Petr. Uh, it's a bit of a history one. Uh, hello, could you please tell us what it meant to work uh, under Rem Kolhas in Oma, both in professional and perhaps in a personal way as well? Yeah, um, it's yeah. So a lot of people forget that I I mean even worked there. It's well, it, it was a long time ago. But um, no, I, when I when I graduated from um, undergrad uh, from grad school at Harvard. I I really asked myself like I want I want to work for someone whose work I respect and that I really want to learn from because as architects you know you you have this period where you are a stagiaire and you have an opportunity to do whatever you want for a few years. So I had a list a short list of about three different architects that I liked and they happened to be on two in the European continent and one in the US. And um, I just started at OMA. At, Rem was a, a professor at Harvard, but I, it wasn't my professor, but I, I knocked on that door and I somehow I got that opportunity. Um, and it was, um, it was really great because um, the, the, the way that the firm does research uh, really, was similar to the way I think about it. Uh, the question, being able to, you know, make a project address more issues than just the brief um, and think about it that way um, was uh, really my way of thinking. At, and then I also really liked the, I learned the collaborative um, way of working with engineers. But that is something I, my, my dad was an engineer and I, I've always wanted to know the engineering criteria when I start a project and, and just all the facts. I want to know the facts before jumping in with some idea. Um, and so we, we were very collaborative with our engineers there as well. We worked a lot with Arup and others. Um, so that was those that all things that I had a good experience to take away. Um, and when I started my own practice, which I had always known I was going to do, I, I really took those valuable lessons with. And then, um, you know, and Rem was someone that I really respected. And I was there when um, we were working on the book, Small, Medium, Large, Extra, extra Large. <laughs> and so um, I got to see some of that taking place and, and um, the projects that I was working on, the Congrex Expo, and then I, then I did the um, house in Bordeaux. Um, those were both projects that were, I think, a crucial projects for the office. Um, and I, I met a lot of great talented people there and got to work with Rem. It was a lot smaller office at the time so I think overall is a good experience, but you know, inside I always wanted to do my own thing. And um, I really, my practice as you can see is, it it's really goes back to more my upbringing and my connection to just the fascination with nature and how it's organized and it, the systems that it has and the uh, geometries that it teaches us about. And then, and, and material studies and structure, um, the tectonic thing. I, I didn't agree with OMA's approach at the time um, of like, you know, not focusing on the, the way the building is constructed because I really find that um, 
another tool that an architect can use to to speak about concepts. And so, you know, my work really is, it's not only about just the form, it is also about the construction and, the, and this kind of materiality um, in a deep way. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Martin. It says, you're the most influential architect in the world this year by Time Magazine. How does that make you feel? <laughs> well, um, first of all, I, I, um, I, I think it gives me a sense that um, some of the positions that I've taken are, it, it does matter. I mean, like, um, for example, um, I wrote an op-ed about um, equal pay for gender for in, in architecture and, and how we could achieve it. Um, and that was published in the New York Times or in the Fast Company. And it, I think it just, it laid out um, a methodology for doing it and, and showed, I was hoping that it would, you know, help my peers who are men and women and uh, to, to understand that it's a good investment um, if everyone is paid equally, then we will start to see more, you know, like much better um, productivity and leadership and, and it's a benefit for everyone. Um, so sometimes I speak out about things that others might say, well, oh, that's not about architecture, but, but honestly, I really don't, um, I have to do what I feel is, is the best for our field and for the environment. And so, so I'm, I think those things are influential in the end, but it's not the reason why I do it. Um, so yeah, but anyway, but having someone recognize that and, and put, put you on a list like that, it says, okay, you're not crazy. You're doing the right thing. So I guess that's how I feel about it. Maybe if we go a little bit, a little bit back, uh, talking about the, the pay gap uh, have you how can you implement that for perhaps in a in an architectural practice have you implemented it in your own practice in studio gang um, yeah yeah um, well um, our firm is about I, we're about 130 people and it's about half and half um, men and women and and it's you know we, I never thought that there would be a gap there because because we really work as equals on every team there there isn't really any split in the hierarchy there um i have w um, equal amounts of men and women in leadership positions it's you know so um there's there wasn't any conscious bias um but when in the uk put out a um some metrics um that they were asking all firms to, to use to check their um, equality. And my CFO, my chief financial officer in my office, she came to me and said, should we try applying these to our office? And um, I said, well, yeah, we're gonna just find out that it's all equal. Um, but when we did apply the metrics, which were um, not only the pay, but you know, bonuses and um, other, you know, other aspects, amount of vacation and all these different things. When you added it all up, we had a small gap. Um, it wasn't big, but it was there. And it was really, you know, it really made me wonder like, why, how did that get there? So we then, um, we were able to adjust that and get it to zero to equality, um, within one round of raises essentially and eliminate that gap. But, but the thing is, um, if you don't eliminate it, like it can get bigger, I think. And that's what, that's what I, my concern is for architecture practices that, and, and um, you know, some architecture practices, if it's, if it's all, um, if it's, if it's unequal in terms of numbers, then like if there's way more men than women, for example, um, you can just pay the women like more and it's just a handful of women making more money and get it equal. 
but that's not the point. The, I mean, the thing is, if you if it's it can get um, out of balance very quickly. I don't know really the reason why. I think it's um, we have some theories about, it, but uh, but it it can happen. So it's important to get it balanced, and you just have these these levels of experience. And sure, some people are like much more um, they're superstars, and they should get rewarded, you know, but. Um, with more pay, but you know, in general, people are in architecture. You have experience, and your abilities should help dictate what the pay level should be. So it's it's important not to let it get out of control because then it's going to be harder and harder to make that up. Thank you. Uh, I also I kind of want to. Uh, there's a discussion that uh, a lot of my friends, architects, have during sort of this uh, lockdown town time, and it's about. Uh, how can an architect, uh, I mean, if you have a doctor or a bus driver that has to be sort of in the front line, that's one thing. How, what's the architect's or urban planner's specific role that they can do sort of to inspire good or to be of you know, purpose uh, yeah. at this town? How, how do you view that? What can architects do? Yeah, I mean, we've seen um, architects that are helping to, you know, make PPE equipment or pr personal protection equipment and things with printers. And I think that's just a, it's like, I think there's so much desire to want to help. Um, um, and that, so that's like one thing that's kind of, um, it's an object. It's, it's like, you know, something that you could see and feel like you did something, but I think we have to be, first we have to be good citizens and, and, you know, like recognize and follow the guidelines that are being provided. So just not as architects, but as regular citizens. And then we can use our um, powers of helping to organize space um, to, I think to help, I started thinking about this as we um, move into uh, re-entry. How do buildings, how can buildings be reorganized to accommodate this extra space that's needed? Um, that's like a spatial planning thing that I think we would be really good at doing. Um, so maybe volunteering to help that with in um, for buildings that are near you, like your apartment buildings, you know, thinking about things like elevator use or common area use, um, timing, and in your offices. And I think those are like skills that can that can help like in this kind of next scale up from the citizen to the to the wider community. Um, and then after that, it becomes the next scale, which is like helping your city um, design and plan for these types of open spaces and um, codes about fresh air, um, requiring those. We have to get active politically to get involved in those type of things so that they can change for the better. So we have uh, a couple more questions of more of a, a technical sort of side. There, there's a question about high rises. Uh, how do these super tall and super uh, super buildings at Manhattan can even stand? How deep are their foundation and what is going on in the top floors? Do they move? Ah, it's a great, great question. Um, like that's one of the reasons that I, I mean, another kind of reason I'm interested in tall buildings is just like the engineering aspect of it. Like there, you really have to work closely with structural engineers, obviously when you're doing tall buildings from the very beginning, because the foundations are different. Like for example, in Chicago, the, the ground is really this very clay, clay-y, mushy, not, not great foundation. So it's always, it always amazed me that that's where the skyscraper started, um, but it was about figuring out the foundations. And, and, and in places like Chicago, you can do piles that go down a hundred feet or, you know, or 200 feet even um, down below the ground. Um, sometimes those piles reach bedrock um, and sometimes they just are friction, you know, holding it up on friction. Um, so. And then in New York, it's very different because New York is on bedrock. 
So it's much easier to put the foundations um, into a solid foundation of solid natural rock. Um, and so the foundation is, of course, you know, it's all cantilevering up out of the ground. So um, yes, there's movement like there would be on a horizontal cantilever. You know, it's the same, but it's going vertical. So you have this movement with wind being the, um, the main force. And um, so you can design the building to be very stiff um, and, you know, or, or you can design the building to um, counteract the movement using a mass damper on the top. Like it can be a tank of water or it could be a big mass um, and it moves at a different rate than the, the wind and that kind of settles it down and makes it more comfortable. And then you can put a hole in the building too. That's what we're, we end up doing with um, the tower. This is our new approach is to leave the wind but pass through the building. Um, and so that really reduces the movement as well. And the movement, you know, it's, it's not a structural issue. It, it would be a structural issue, but, you know, the building's designed so that it can, it's going to move, but it's really about the comfort of the occupants so they don't get seasick, you know, up there. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I think the, the understanding how the wind interacts with taller buildings and not only them on their own, but their, the surroundings is it's important to really look at it in, you know, CFD modeling and wind tunnel testing um, because some things are unexpected that, that um, are putting force on the building. Well, we have a follow-up on that actually. Uh, it it's, uh, pertains to the San Francisco building, uh, asking whether these exterior panels that you showed us were uh, prefabricated in a shop. Uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a good uh, question. It's um, in San Francisco, you know, part of the buildings are very, it, it, the cost of construction is very high. And so, um, and you also have a, a dense city and you don't want to have um, disturbances to the neighbors around there. So early on, we started to think about doing a pre-insulated, pre-clad um, bay window uh, that could be um, more quickly attached and to enclose the building. And so that was the driver. The driver was, you know, um, better water protection, faster um, insulation and, and to speed the, yeah, to speed the construction um, and reduce the disturbance. And so we we did we worked with on that with a couple different companies looking at trying mock-ups, um, and as you could see, because the balconies are are um, shifting, you know we have soffits and ledges that have to be waterproof. So, uh, but it, it in the end we achieved it as a three-dimensional um, prefabricated um, elements that enclose the building. Perfect. It's metal, by the way, yeah. Uh, we're slowly uh, reaching the, 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 the final uh, question. Uh, perhaps, uh, actually, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, what's ne next for you now? You're in North Car Carolina, are you going back to Chicago? How's the, <laughs> yeah. how, how's the office handling everything? What's, what's, up, what's up with you for the next few weeks? Um, I'm, I'm heading back to Chicago and um, getting ready, to getting our, our different offices um, we, our teams have created um, some re-entry plans. So we're kind of going over those now and, um, and we're getting ready to go back into our space, uh, spaces. And we'll probably, yeah, do it slowly and carefully. And, um, but then, um, yeah, lots of um, projects that are, um, some were just going into construction um, and so, um, trying to work through that. Some that were just going out to bid. Should we wait? Uh, should we just put it out there? Um, you know, what's happening with the economy? And then uh, some new pursuits as well um, and some competitions. So, um, 
No, all in all, it's it's really one thing that we really do we do every year is a a camp Wanda Wega. So like camp really resonated with me of your <laughs> your camp and our camp we we go we all get together from all the offices and and go and out and do fun things together and and learn about nature and do activities. I mean, it's really about getting to know each other and building our trust. And, um, but that's one thing that I think we might not be able to do this year. So we're trying to think of alternatives to that as well. So it's nice to be at your camp because we might not get to go to our camp. Well, we're glad that you <laughs> joined us at our camp. We hope that uh, your camp will work just as well in person, that you won't have to do it via Zoom. And hopefully you'll join us in person at our camp sometime uh, in the future as well. So thank you, Jeannie, for joining us. And I can't uh, yeah, stay safe mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you, everyone. Nice to not see you, but nice to be here with you. Um, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye. And before uh, we say goodbye, let me just uh, do a brief invitation for other lectures at events we have coming up, uh, especially on, uh, on Monday, uh, this upcoming Monday. Uh, you should check out Dizine's Virtual Design Festival, where we'll be uh, starting with a live stream with Kengo Kuma, the Japanese architect uh, who will be streaming live from Tokyo, uh, followed up by some uh, our lectures from our archive. There's a presentation by Snoheta. Uh, there's a presentation uh, by Kobe Architects from Copenhagen and uh, Brooklyn Studio Interborough. So you should check that out on our social media or on uh, www.urbantalks.camp. So thank you very much for joining us uh, this week for uh, Urban Talks and see you soon.